Thank you so much, Miguel. I have not heard that song in a long time. What a blessing. I, I really appreciated that. And uh, leading out in the other ways uh, with our music today, thank you, Miguel and George, for playing guitar and, and uh, being our, our elder today. I uh, appreciate our, our team. And uh, Lisa, who are you sitting with? I've heard about her. And now I get to see her in, in person. That's wonderful. Welcome. Glad that you're here. Try not to embarrass you too much, but Lisa talks about you a lot. I think she kind of likes you. <laughs> so glad. And I, I, we have some folks from uh, Pennsylvania here I got to meet earlier. Do you sing some of these songs in Pennsylvania too? Do you know uh, these songs? Are you familiar with them? Good. Good. I'm glad. Uh, that, that's one of the nice things about uh, some songs that we're familiar with. It's good to sing some hymns, and we love our praise songs as well, but we, we, we kind of have all kinds here. Um, well, let me, uh, let me have a, a word of prayer as I uh, begin the sermon this morning. God in heaven, Lord, we honor your presence here, Lord, and we realize uh, we are here uh, for your purposes uh, more than anything. We love the opportunity to see one another fellowship, have friendship, and, and talk, and and uh, that's, that's certainly part of the beauty and pleasure of being part of a church, Lord. Uh, but ultimately, we are here to hear your spirit, uh, to commune with you, to connect, and Lord, to have that confidence that you are in our lives and that you are directing. So God, uh, thank you for everyone who's here, uh, for those watching online. Um, and uh, God, just continue to bless your people, bless your church, uh, that we may uh, fulfill your purposes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I uh, am going to just share a kind of an old-fashioned Bible study uh, with you. If you don't have a Bible, I, I hope that you can at least uh, uh, use a, a device, um, or you can just follow along. I'm going to be using mostly familiar passages and, and stories, uh, but it will uh, presume that you have at least some familiarity with some of the stories of the Bible, um, one story in particular, but uh, this, is, this is just going to be a kind of a, a, a classic Bible study together. I, th I thought that would be nice uh, this summer and uh, uh, a nice transition. Last week, we spent a good amount of time in John chapter 8. It was kind of my after 4th of July uh, message on freedom and and the liberty that God brings us and the privileges of, of being in a country that recognizes that our, our freedoms come from God. And, and uh, so that was John chapter 8. Uh, I'm going to be in Luke chapter 8 today. And we're going to be looking at freedom in a different context. And uh, so Luke chapter 8 is where the primary story is going to be. You're welcome to turn there. And as you are, I am going to have my kids quiz. I know we only have a handful of kids here. Um, but uh, I'd love to have your uh, participation uh, with me this morning as we kind of get into the story that we're going to be looking at. Um, Luke chapter 8 is the story. Uh, the main story we're going to look at is the story of Jesus and a man who was possessed with a demon, actually, uh, or with uh, 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 struggling with demons. So that's what story. So I want to just see if you remember much about this story. This is a very interesting story. What was the name of the demon or demons that were possessing the man? Do you remember? Is this is unique. This is really the only time in all of Scripture where Jesus kind of interacts with a fallen angel. Most of the time, he just says, "Be quiet," you know. I don't want to hear it, or, you know, or, or you know, he just gets rid of them. But this is this is a different dynamic in this story, and that's what, what makes it of interest. Caleb, you want to shout it out? I see your kind of hesitant hand going up, but you've got it, don't you? I can see the confidence in your face as you sit here, go like this. Can you can you try? You don't even want to try. All right. Anyone else? What was the name of that demon when Jesus asked, what is your name? Yeah, I was hoping I didn't make this too complicated. All right, Toby, maybe you had some help. What, what is it? Legion. Legion. That's right. He says, Legion, for we are many. It's kind of a, 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 an overall identification of what was happening uh, in the life of the man. Question number two. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll recap this story when we get into it, but I just want to see if we remember, where was this man living when Jesus met him? Not the name of the city, like was he living in the marketplace? Was he living in the hills? What, the, the Bible identifies that he was living in a very specific place. Do you remember where that was? I'll give you a hint. It's a place where the dead are buried. Chloe? What did she say? 
in a cave? Well, kind of, kind of. I'm going to give it to you, actually. You're going to get it. He was living amongst the tombs. That's what the Bible says. He was living amongst the tombs, and a lot of the tombs were in caves. That's where Jesus was buried, wasn't he? He was in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock, which we would often refer to as a cave. All right, number three, what, herd, what kind of animals, what herd of animals did these fallen angels go into after the man uh, was healed? What kind of animals did they go into? All right, Caleb, more confidence this time. I saw that hand go straight up. Yeah, it was. It was pigs, swine. That's what happened in the story. Then what did the swine do? What did the swine do in the story? Declan? You're going to have to say it again. They fell off a cliff? Well, that's kind of right. Yeah, it says they rushed down a steep embankment and they were drowned. Yeah, so that's what happened. Those poor little piggies. We'll talk about that a little bit as part of the story. All right, last question. How did the people act when they saw Jesus and the man in his right man mind. So the people that lived in that vicinity in the city, when they saw Jesus and they saw that the man had been healed, they were what? Do you remember? Were they excited? Were they like, yeah, Jesus, we're so happy. Wonderful that uh, this guy is in good shape now. He's, he's going to come back into the community. Is that what they did or did they do something else? Do you remember in the story? How did the people act? I'm trying to uh, help. <laughs> okay, Caleb, I'll let you go again. They were upset. Amazing. Here, a, a tremendous miracle has taken place. A life has been restored. A life has been changed. Healing has taken place. And the people became very afraid. And they actually say, Jesus, would you please leave? Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, thank you, uh, uh, kids, for helping out and part of that to, to get us into the story. We are going to look at this story in a little bit more detail. Uh, and again, just an old-fashioned Bible study. And, and we're going to be uh, in our Bibles a little bit. And uh, uh, we're looking at some different verses. But before we get that, so this story begins in Luke chapter 8 and beginning in verse 26. But whenever you do a Bible study, even before you get into the story too much, there's a couple of things you ought to do. And this is something that's important when you're doing your own personal Bible study or maybe in a group. First, you want to notice the context. Where does this story come from? What is around this story that influences its position and, 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 and its meaning? And so right away, you notice a couple of things. One, the story just preceding this story, the story that came just before it, was the story actually that Miss Gloria uh, did for children's story, which I thought was wonderful. That exact story is the story that comes just before this one, Jesus showing his power over the elements of the earth. Okay, he fell asleep in the boat, the great storm came, and, and the disciples became afraid, and they wake up Jesus, and Jesus shows his power over the waters and the wind and the elements of the earth. Okay, so that story, that's, that's the initial context. That's what the, this, this next story follows that. But then I also like to look at the story after as well. Again, we could go to the broader, we could look at the book of the Bible and say it's in the New Testament, and even the time period, first century, all that. But I'm just looking at the immediate context within the, uh, the Gospel of Luke itself. So then you go to the story just after the demoniac is healed. That begins in verse 40, and it's that famous story of Jesus going to heal Jairus' daughter. And on the way, a woman who had that sickness knew that Jesus was coming. Do you remember this? And while Jesus was walking by, she, she reached out and said, if I just touch even the hem of his garment or that tassel, if I just touch that, he has the power. If I can just get that close of a connection, I have the faith that he can heal me. And, and she was healed. And Jesus notices it, and he blesses her. But then he does go to Jairus' house, and they say, don't even come. Don't bother the master because the little girl is dead. But then Jesus said, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And he raises her from the sleep of death. So I just want you to notice that parallel, or excuse me, um, a book ending the story of the healing of the demoniac, Luke, in his gospel message, he is trying to establish the ultimate authority and power of Jesus. And he does so first with showing Jesus power over the natural elements. Then on the other end, he shows the power of Jesus over disease and death. But right in between, right in between these two massive stories of his power over the elements and his power over disease and death, he puts the story of Jesus' power over demons. Now, this is very important in the first century and in the understanding of the Jewish mindset because to the Jewish mind, 
The power of the demons was the most significant power that a person could have. More than healing of disease. More even than the raising of the dead. And you'll see this throughout the Gospels because, you know, Jesus gives his disciples the authority to do his works. Do you remember that? He sends out the 12. He sends out the 70. Okay, you can look at that. It just follows in chapter 9. He sends out the 12. It says he gave them power and authority over the demons and to heal diseases. In Matthew, it says he gave them power even to raise people from the dead. And then in chapter 11, he sent, or in chapter 10, he sends out the 70. And in verse 17 of chapter 10, look at what it says. Verse chapter 17 of chapter 10, it says, The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now, I just want you to notice the significance of that for a second. Jesus had given them a power to heal diseases. Jesus had given them power to raise the dead. And they had done that. When you look at the, uh, the gospel stories, it says that they used this authority and significance to do the works of Jesus that he had given them the power to do. But when they return to him, the one thing that stands out to them, they say, Lord, we healed, and that was great. And Lord, we even raised some from the dead, and that was great. But you want to know what's amazing? We even, we even had the power to make demons subject to us in your name. Okay? Because they, in this spiritual context, they thought demons were behind everything. They thought demons were behind disease. They thought demons were behind death. So you could deal with the disease, but you might not deal with the demon. You could deal with the death, but you might not deal with the demon. To the early Christian and the early Jewish mind of this time, to have the power and authority, even of the spiritual realm, was the most significant. Okay? So this is what Luke is doing for us in this story. That's why this story is paralleled by these two other significant examples of the power of Jesus. The power of the elements, the power of a disease and death. But right in between, you have this remarkable story of Jesus showing his authority and success and power even over the demons. So that's the initial context. And we can, again, we could go into deeper context of other you know, historical and scriptural things like that. But... Uh, Suffice to say, that's where I want to begin. But next, I want us to identify the characters, the characters in this story. And it's really quite simple. There's only two, Jesus and the demoniac. Now, we know there are many sub-characters, some co-stars in the story, if you will. Okay, we know the disciples were there. There are people from the community. Even the pigs are there. All right, they're part of the story. But really, this is a controversy between two individuals, one who's possessed with an evil spirit and one who's possessed with the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's what this is. This is a showdown between God and the agents of evil working through a human agency. Okay? So there's really only two primary characters in this story. And then we're going to get into the content. So context, the characters, and now the content. Now, I know that most of you know this story well, but I'm going to read it through once, and then I'm going to come back, and we're just going to catch a few things, okay? So it's about 20 verses or so. Stick with us. Again, you've probably heard this before, but maybe you'll hear some things you hadn't thought of or you're going to be reminded of as we read. I do this kind of quick because I have lots to say, and I like to go fast. So um, we're going to read together. Are you with me? All right. Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. I'm reading from my Bible. The New American Standard is what I have up here today. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which opposite of Galilee. And when he came out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons and who had not put on clothing for a long time. He was not living in a house, but in the tombs. Seeing Jesus, he cried out, fell before him, and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. It had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard. He, but yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountains. And the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine. And he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. And when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran out away and reported in the city and out in the country. The people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man who, uh, from whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at his, the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they became frightened. <laughs> Very interesting. Those who had seen it reported to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been made well. 
That's the Greek word sozo there, by the way, in case you're wondering. And all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear, and he got into the boat and returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him. But he sent him away, saying, Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Okay, so I know I read that kind of fast. And again, that was meant mostly as a refresher for those of you who know this story um, and, and, and you've read it before. And maybe you've thought of most of the things I'm going to share with you. But sometimes when we take a moment and we pause and we look at a story we're familiar with, sometimes we see things that uh, we may not have seen before or, or caught upon first glance. So I just want to come back now and go this a little bit slower and spend some time in the scriptures with you analyzing the, 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 the uh, meaning. And I, I hate to say that I have all the possible meanings of this, but some of the initial meanings that uh, I would like to share with you. First, come back with me now to verse 26. Good old-fashioned Bible study this morning. They sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee, right after Jesus had calmed the storm. Okay, okay this, is, this is the story that follows it. They, Jesus gets out of the boat, so he's on the beach. Sometimes you have to put yourself in their uh, actual uh, position, right? Walk through the story. They're not in the marketplace. They're, they're not up in the hillside. Jesus gets out of the boat. All right? they're, they're on the beach. And when he came out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons, who had not put on any clothing for a long time, and he was not living in a house but in the tombs. Now, this story is actually shared in all three synoptic gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And each of them share a little more detail or a little different angle to the story. But what's clear here is the Bible goes out of its way to make this man as scary as possible. Okay? He's naked. Okay? In Matthew and Mark, it talks about how he would cut himself. All right, and that he would, you know, we read later how he was chained, but he would rip his chains off. They put him on, he was living in the tombs. Now, the, really, the scriptures go out of the way to say this is not someone you would normally want to meet uh, when you first walk outdoors, okay? And, and this is the type of thing where you're glad you're with Jesus when you're in this situation. You know what I mean? Would you want to be without Jesus when you're met by this individual? We need to have Jesus with us all the time, though, don't we? So Jesus is the main character here. We know the disciples are there, but they're not mentioned in any prominence in this story. They meet this individual, and from all external circumstances, you would say this is probably about the scariest circumstance you can find yourself in, meeting an individual like this. He is a mess, an absolute mess. But in verse 28, it says, Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. A very interesting. Now, one thing that we cannot pass over, and I know there's a temptation to do that because we don't often want to think about the inner workings of evil. We don't want to think about, uh, you know, how the, the demons operate. And by the way, I even hesitate to use the word demon. It's a very biblical word. But when we say the word demon, it conjures up things that Hollywood and medieval superstition have put into our minds. Demons are fallen angels. They are glorious beings of power. They are not little twisted gargoyles, right? They are not little bulbous-eyed imps that, that uh, have mindless uh, 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 behaviors and wear red leotards, okay, and forked tails, right? All of that are lies. And, and again, if you just in, in general just say, you, you know, demon this or that, people, your mind, if you've been engaged in our culture at all, your mind goes to these very ugly, monstrous ideas. Now, don't get me wrong. They're monsters because of their behavior. Okay? They're absolute rejection of God. But these are not mindless beings. They are glorious, powerful creations of God. The Bible says that the devil himself transforms himself into an angel of light to the point that you as a believer would have no knowledge of whether you're seeing a real angel of God or a fallen angel. Satan was able to disguise himself to the point that at Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, Jesus was unable to discern whether or not this was Satan or not until Satan betrayed himself by saying, if you're the son of God then do this. And, the, and, and Ellen White says it was at that moment 
that Jesus knew he was in the presence of a fallen angel because he knew the word of God, that God had said, this is my beloved son. No true, no true messenger of God would come to him afterwards and say, well, if you're the son of God. He betrayed himself. So I just want you to keep this in mind when we talk about this. And so I often try to use the term fallen angel much more than demon because, again, we conjure up all these things that are really not helpful to our understanding of the great controversy. So here we see this fallen angel, this man who is possessed with, with a, a legion of fallen angels, and yet in the presence of Jesus, maybe normally he would come out and attack people. Maybe he would come out and in his wild behavior, he would just drive people away. And you get this idea that the community wanted him to be on the outskirts of town. They wanted him to be out there because he was causing so many problems, but they had tolerated it to a point, I guess you could say. But he comes out and he says, do not torment me, for he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Now, it's a very interesting question. What would be tormenting to a fallen angel to be driven out of their possession, of, being, of, of their being that they had possessed? Why would that be a torment? You ever, you ever think about that? What is it that, that, that is going on in this story that gives us a little bit of a behind-the-scenes understanding of what's happening in this great controversy that's happening? Now, I'm going to have to go on a little bit of a rabbit trail Bible study with you this morning. Okay? But this is, again, this is just a, a, an exercise I wanted to go with you, and this is a good principle for your, your Bible study in general. When we understand what is going on in the great controversy, and we understand the role that uh, angels and fallen angels play, it helps us better understand the gospel as well. Um, in Luke 11, uh, you could go to Matthew 12 too, but in Luke 11, Jesus gives us a little bit more information um, about what happens when a devil, a demon, is driven out. Luke 11 and verse 24. And again, there's not a whole lot of Scripture on this. There's only a handful of little uh, nuggets here and there, but when you put them all together, the picture comes together. Okay? Uh, Jesus has just been talking about how uh, he has not been driving out demons by the spirit of Beelzebub, but the, you know, the, uh, a house divided about against itself cannot stand. Okay, and then in verse 24 of Luke 11, Jesus says this, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places, or arid, or dry places, seeking rest. Seeking rest. And not finding any, it says, I will return to my house. Okay, the person that had uh, previously been uh, uh, possessed. From which I come, and when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order, but empty is the idea here. And then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself. They go and live there, and the last state of the man becomes worse than the first. So this is just one of those little snippets where the Lord himself says, look, in this experience, first of all, when you have this uh, cleansing in your life take place, you need to fill it. Okay, the Lord doesn't come just to drive out the evil uh, so that you can just be hollow and empty. He wants to drive out the evil so that you can be filled with that which is holy and good. And that's not just about uh, spirits and things like that. But if he takes away an addiction, if he takes away a behavior, if he takes away a compulsion that is destructive to you, you will not find success if you just step back and say, oh, wow, that's gone now. I don't gamble anymore, or I don't swear anymore, or I don't drink anymore. But I'm not going to re replace that with anything that is holy and, and, and righteous and good. You'll just slip back right into those uh, behaviors or situation again. But Jesus specifically says that... Uh, uh, the the uh, fallen angels are in a place of restlessness, in a place of discomfort when they are outside of that abode that they had been part of. Now, when God first drove the angels out of heaven, where did they go? You, you remember the, the story of, of uh, uh, there was war in heaven? Okay? And, and Satan lost. And he was driven out of heaven. Where did he go? Dr. Herber? Uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, says, And his tail swept a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Excuse me, that's uh, verse 4. Cast them to the earth. Isaiah chapter 14, speaking of Lucifer himself, it says, how you've been brought down, how you have been cast down to the earth. All right? There's several places where we can look in the Bible that when the, the angels rebelled, 
God put them in the abyss of the earth. Okay? Into the darkness of the earth. Come with me now to 2 Peter. Actually, let's go to Jude first. Um, both Jude and 2 Peter are going to say something similar. That little tiny book right before Revelation, the book of Jude. Verse 6. It's only one chapter, so we don't normally say Jude 1-6. You can just say Jude 6, and you're, you're doing fine. Okay? Jude and verse 6. Angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Okay? And then Second Peter, which uh, gives a very similar uh, language as, as the book of Jude, but we'll read it from Second Peter in, uh, uh, as well. Second Peter chapter, I mean, yeah. Chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into... Now, many of your Bibles will say the word hell here. Okay? Cast them into hell they, and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Okay? But this is a unique word in all the Bible. It's only found one place. It's the Greek word tartarus or tartarus. Okay? Not to be confused with tartar sauce. Okay? Um, it is a, a Greek mythological place, and it just means a place of darkness. Okay, so again, a little bit of a Bible study here about, you know, the, the, the science of, of sin and the great controversy and what happened to angels. Stick with me here. There's um, going to be one more uh, idea that I want to take you to in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 12. You ever heard of the place of outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth? I know this sounds like a not a very pleasant topic. Okay, but it's part of the biblical text and story, and it's part of the Bible study, okay? Uh, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 12. It, it gets better, right? It gets better. God wins, right? <laughs> okay, Matthew chapter 8, and this is only one place. There's about a dozen places we could look at this context. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, come back to the story with the, the demoniac in Jesus there in Luke chapter 8 when he says, what do we have to do with each other? Please do not torment me. Where is the place of torment? What is uh, the possibility? What is this uh, demon referring to and asking Jesus not to do at that time? So within the story of the great controversy and the fall of angels, the theory is this. The idea is this. When you go to the book of Genesis chapter 1, the very first thing that God does when he comes to this planet is he creates what? Light. What was there before the light? Darkness and water. Right? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. The earth was formless and void. And the spirit of the, of the, of the Lord hovered over the deep of the waters. So when God came to this earth, there was already darkness and the abyss. What was there? Where did the demons go when they were cast out of heaven? On what day did Satan come into the garden? He was already here. This was, the earth was the abyss. The earth was the place of reserved judgment for the fallen angels. And when God came to this earth, he created it new, and he knew that the tempter was already here, and he said, Adam, Eve, stay away from this one area that I have uh, allowed the tempter to be uh, to fulfill the, 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 uh, the question that has been risen about the character of God. But if you follow me, you'll not fall into that trap. So the, the demons were placed. You know, what's the worst thing we do that's allowed in civilized society to criminals? We put them in solitary confinement. Right? And that's about, aside from capital punishment, that's about the, 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 the furthest a civilized society will go to uh, hold people in punishment, in darkness and solitude. Okay? And that's the prison that the demons had been in until they were unleashed when Adam and Eve fell into sin. And you're saying, what in the world are we even talking about here, Pastor? It gives us an understanding of what the demons are saying when they say, do not torment us. And Jesus says, uh, um, when a spirit's driven out, they, they're restless. 
They need to be, okay, here, here's the other idea. What is that outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth? The Bible says that God is light, right? So if God is light, wouldn't you say the outer darkness is as far from God as can be? Is that, is that consistent? Does that work for you? That that was the, the, the result of the rebellion in heaven is that God removed the, those fallen angels and put them as far away from his light as possible. And that was the place where they were held until they were reserved for judgment. Does that make sense for you? So all of these things, all of this backstory is playing into this uh, story of the demoniac face to face once more with the Son of God. Do not torment me. I'm back in Luke 8, in case you're wondering. Verse 29. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of him. And maybe later on, it says that the spirit, the, uh, they were imploring him not to command him to go away into the abyss. Where had they come from? The abyss. They were worried that he was going to send him back into the abyss. Keep that in mind. He had seized him many times. He was bound with chains, shackles, yet they would break the bonds and the, he'd be driven out by the demon into the desert. He said, what is your name? And he said, Legion. Now, I just think it's interesting, Luke, in this story and in the other stories, the demon identifies himself as Legion. Now, if you're a first century Jew, or even if you're a first century Gentile, when you hear the word Legion, what do you think of? Okay, first century, who's ruling the world right now? When you hear the word Legion, your immediate thought is Roman armies. Roman oppression, the Roman Empire. There's lots of words this demon could, he could have said. We're multitude, we're plethora, you know, we're millions. You know, there's lots of things he could have said. He chose the, the identification of that symbol of oppression. We are legion. You know that army out there that keeps you from being free? You know that army that taxes you and takes your children as slaves, doesn't allow you to own land? That's who we are. We are legion. In any first century, oh, uh, just a little, little Bible study principle for you. Before you ask what a verse means, always ask what it meant. You, you understand, Vince, you, you, you with me on that? Before you ask, well, what does it mean today? What does it mean to me? What does it mean, you know, for the church today? And those are all fine questions, but this had an original audience first. It was written by Luke in the first century. You should always ask, what did it mean then? Before you ask, what does it mean now? And you get so much more richness and, and understanding of the text. When he said legion, this was not just a random idea. This was a symbol of, of, of oppression coming from the Roman institution. Yes, it indicated the size as well. Uh, a Roman legion, several thousand, three thousand, five thousand. There were different ways in which le legions were numerated. But it's an idea of just total and complete oppression. Now, this is important, too. Let me ask you this. A good question. I don't know if you ever asked this. What was Legion doing there? What purpose did Legion serve to be there? Does he, was he just there randomly? I'm just looking for something to do. Oh, here's this city up here in the north, and here's a guy who's messed up his mind, and he's inviting me in. I guess I'll just sit, sit tight and go into this guy over here and make him go crazy. Remember, demons are fallen angels. There was purpose. There was meaning. Why would Satan send a legion to this city? Do you think that perhaps Satan knew that Jesus was going to be there? To quote the emperor Toby, an entire legion of my best troops await them. I'm afraid that the deflector shield will be quite operational when your friends come. <laughs> Little thing, you know, inside. And just as that emperor failed to understand the righteousness of the rebellion. <laughs> so did the devil fail to understand the righteousness of Christ. But this was not, there's no coincidences with God, right? Satan sent a legion of his best troops 
to confront and confound and reject and drive away the righteousness of Christ. That's why he was there. Maybe he'd been there for a decade, but the devil knew the day would come when Jesus would step out on the shore and be there to work his power and miracles and set people free. And the devil said, I'm going to do everything I can to prevent him from, being, from doing that and being there. And so legion was sent. Now, verse 32. Well, we could go into a lot of other things there too, but I, I think that's uh, uh, part of what's going on. Verse 32. Now, there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountains, and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine. Don't miss biblical irony. He just said we are legion, and the very next verse is, now there were many swine. Now Luke does this with, uh, uh, all the time. Luke loves to do comparisons. All throughout, I could give you many examples. He loves to pair these things together. It is not by chance and by fact that Luke does it. But, but when the demon says we're legion, and then the almost very next verse says, now there were many swine, Luke is saying, yeah, they kind of are the same thing. It's not, an, it's not just an accident. He's saying just as there were legion here, uh, and, and that, that's a symbol of Roman oppression, you know, that's just like these swine over here on the mountains, okay? Don't we to this very day call people we don't like pigs? Don't we? To this very day we equate people we disagree with or don't like or even be sources of authority over us or as oppressors over us, we call them pigs, and that is the same thing happening here. Just a, a, a little bit of scriptural irony in that where Luke says, now there were many swine. Well, just enough, one swine for every one of those legion. And it's interesting. And the demons asked Jesus permission. Now, the, the devil, you know, uh, probably wanted legion to oppose and legion to scare and legion to do all this. But in the presence of the Son of God, they are overwhelmed and they cannot help but fall on their face before God. Now, here's a, another thing I want you to understand. There are different kinds of, of spiritual activities that cause oppression, okay? Not all the time does it cause people to behave in this manner where they become reckless, mindless, insane individuals. The Bible says that the devil himself went into Judas, did Judas take off his clothes and run amongst the tombs and behave wildly? No, he betrayed his best friend. Okay? It's very clear that when the Pharisees cried out, crucify him, crucify him, that the devil was inspiring that. Jesus says in John chapter 8, you are of your father the devil and you do the desires of him. There were many people under the control and authority and possession of evil spirits all over that place. Not all of them behaved this way. Okay? When Saul was uh, uh, afflicted by a devil, he tried to kill his own son, Jonathan. And on several occasions, he tried to kill David. The devil uses whatever tactics that will bring injury to the person of God, the people of God, or the purpose of God. It does not have to be just that insane behavior that we read here in Luke chapter 8. And just because we don't see the type of behavior in biblical days that we sometimes think about in, in, in the stories of Jesus with, with people being demon-possessed, behaving like that, doesn't mean that the demons have taken a vacation. Does the devil have spiritual forces in his church today? Does the devil have his spiritual forces in Congress today? Does the devil have his spiritual forces in, Cong in, uh, in Hollywood today? Are they all behaving like this? No. Some of them are just betraying each other, lying to each other, Whatever the devil needs to do to bring greatest injury to either the person of God, the people of God, or the purpose of God. He doesn't care uh, what way it looks. But in this context, this man is in, in bad shape and is uh, now imploring Jesus, let us go into the swine, verse 33, and the demon, and he gave them permission, the end of verse 32, Jesus said uh, he gave them permission, and then verse 33, the demons came out of the man, entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. So you have this interesting story, they said, don't torture us, don't torment us, we know where we've come from, we were in the abyss before, we were in solitary confinement and darkness, reserved for judgment, and, and we are, that's not where we want to go again, and by the way, we haven't reached the end of the story yet, Okay, so they asked to go into the swine. Now, why would they prefer the swine to not being in the swine? Have you ever thought about that? Do you want to hear my theory? I have a microphone, so I'm going to tell you my theory. <laughs> uh, truly, 
like I said, I think outer darkness is as far away from God as possible. And that's an as uncomfortable and, and a, 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 a place that the demons do not, they have, it says that they go without seeking rest and finding none. Okay, so the closer they can get to God, the more they can experience at least a little bit of that living light that comes from him. So humanity is made in the image of God. Why do demons want to possess humans at all? I mean, if they're such glorious, wonderful, powerful beings, why do they want to be? It'd be like a, a, a super, uh, you know, rich person, uh, you know, wanting to be poor or something like that, or a super powerful person, you know, wanting to go into the body of, of an invalid or something like that. That's what it would be like for a demon to want to inhabit the soul of a human being. These are, these are powerful beings. Why do they want to do it? Because we're as close to God as they can get without having to acknowledge him. Because we are made in the image of God. And if they can't be in us, they want to go into that which is next, which is the animal kingdom. I think even being in the swine, which are created by God, there's nothing wrong with pigs, by the way. Just because we're not supposed to eat them doesn't mean they don't have purpose. Any of you grow up on a farm? I think pigs are cute. They're very intelligent, too, by the way. Kind of like men. <laughs> they can be that way sometimes. Anyways, so they said it's better for us to go in those pigs than to go into nothingness or the abyss. We'd rather be in pigs, because even pigs are created by God. Even kids, uh, pigs come from the handiwork of God. We'd rather be in those pigs. So Jesus says, okay, you can be in them. And then this interesting thing happens. They all rush off and basically commit mass suicide. And you think to yourself, what is that all about? Now, there's at least three different uh, suggestions that have been made by this, and I don't like any of them. The first, and you'll find this one in, in the SDA commentary, is suggest that the devil did that. This was the devil forcing those pigs to run off into the water, all die. That way, all the people uh, that own those pigs would be, get upset, and they would be unhappy with Jesus. You've ruined our economy. We don't like you. Get out of here, Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that's not a possible answer, but Jesus himself says that the devil doesn't act that way. The devil doesn't uh, uh, fight against himself. Okay, so I don't really like that answer because it just doesn't make sense to me. The second one that you'll hear sometimes is that Jesus made this do it. And then when Jesus told them they could go into the swine, it was kind of a trick. It was kind of like, ha, 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 you want to go into those pigs, huh? All right, go ahead. And when they went to the pigs, then Jesus, through his uh, 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 you know, authority and supervision, made them run off and say, ha, ha, you didn't want to go into the abyss. I made you go there anyway. You're all drowned in the lake now. I don't like that explanation either. I don't think it goes well with the character of God, and, and I don't think it makes sense. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say. When Jesus said, what is your name? Did Jesus know their names? Did he know the name of the man? Yeah. Did he know the name of the demons? Who created those demons, by the way? Who created them? He did. Did he know exactly who they were? Oh, yeah. He knew. I'm not going to go uh, take that any further. You can do with that what you want. So that's the other. I don't like the idea that the, uh, uh, the devil made him, the pigs do it. I don't like the idea that Jesus tricked them and did that either. I don't, like, I don't think that goes with, with uh, the, the revelation of the character of Jesus and of God. The third one that I hear sometimes is that um, the pigs uh, themselves did not like the possession of the, the demons, and so they committed mass suicide because it's better, to, it's better to be dead than to be possessed with the demon. That's another one that I hear. I don't like that one either because then it makes it sound like it's almost better to commit suicide. And I don't think that's right either. You want to know what I think happened? George, would you like to know what I think happened? I'm going to tell you. I think in their panic to get away from Jesus, I think in their absolute hysteria of trying to flee from the presence of the Son of God, they just panicked. And as they began to run and trample one another and to just run wildly. You know, you see this actually in the Old Testament. One of the armies of Assyria, they all killed one another once because there was a great confusion in the camp. Do you remember that story? I was going to look it up. I, I didn't get a chance to look it up. So this is not without precedent that sometimes the en enemies of God in their own panic end up killing themselves as they try to flee from the plan and purpose of God. So I think it was just uh, the, uh, the panic induced hysteria of their own characters that led to their demise. I don't think Jesus had to make it happen. I don't think the devil made it happen. I don't think the pigs thought to themselves it's better to die than to have a demon. I think they did it to themselves. You can email me if you would like to say something else on that. So now we get to the result here. The people went out to see what had happened. They came, they see Jesus. And you know, it's this interesting thing. They become frightened. 
And this is not uncommon. Remember when Jesus was preaching in Peter's boat, and Jesus is preaching with great power and great authority and great clarity, and after he gets done preaching, Peter looks up to Jesus, and he says, uh, Jesus, could you please depart from me? You don't know who I am. I'm a wicked and sinful person. Oftentimes when confronted with the power of God, people recognizing their own frailty and faults want to be separate from that. So this is not uncommon when a powerful uh, event happens that people want to be away from that. I think because of their own sense of their unworthiness or their desire to continue to live in their uh, immoral ways. They reported how they'd seen the demon-possessed man made well. That Again, I said that's that Greek word sozo. It means a holistic healing of mind, body, and soul. This is not a temporary, this is not a partial. He was made complete. Now, I want you to think about something for a second. Jesus was able to save and restore and heal the most frightening, insane, brutal person you can imagine. R really? I, I can't think of a more frightening situation. A person absolutely overwhelmed with a legion of demons. And Jesus saved him. Jesus saved him. And yet the very people he came to save, the Pharisees and Jews, the people of the tribe of Israel, rejected him. Which demon was worse? The demon of our own selfishness and pride or the demonic influences that come from reckless living and rejection and rebellion of God that leads to an openness where spiritual forces dominate our lives. Which one is worse? Jesus can heal even the most wretched. He can save and restore and heal even the most wretched soul that you can imagine. But he cannot save a soul filled with selfishness. That is the most wretched position that we can be in. There were much more frightening people in the Bible than this guy. It was the religious leaders of Israel in all their pomp and circumstance. They were leading people to hell much quicker than this guy was. All the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding districts uh, asked him to leave. They were gripped with great fear, and he got into the boat and returned. Now think about it. Get on the beach with him. He gets into the boat. What's in the water with him right now? Thousands of dead pigs all over that lake. They're having to oar through them, right? They're everywhere as a symbol of, of God setting free one individual. Probably were not Jews. I don't think this has anything to do with clean and unclean. He wasn't, well, that's another thing people, oh, he was punishing people for raising pigs, so he caused their destruction and all that. I, I, I just don't see that. He got into the boat and returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him, but he sent him away. Now, not everyone who wanted to be a follower of Jesus was allowed. To become a disciple of Jesus was a rare privilege. He asked to become a follower. Let me get in the boat with you, please. I've seen what you've done in my life. I want to come with you. But Jesus didn't let him. Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city the great things that Jesus had done for him. The story does not end there. The purpose of the salvation of this person was not simply for one being to get restored with God. He immediately gives him a mission. And says, you have received a great blessing from God today. That legion has been driven out. That spirit has been removed from your life. Whole, your, 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 your body has been healed, mind and soul. Now you get to be the ambassador for God in your own community. Have you ever wondered? Now remember, um, Luke is the author here. Luke also writes the book of Acts. Have you ever wondered why did the early church have so much success when they went out from Jerusalem? How was it that they were able to go out to the countryside, go even to the Gentiles, and say, we want to tell you about Jesus, and all of a sudden churches would spring up. People would get saved. They'd come, and they would be restored and baptized. It was because of people like this guy, who for probably a decade, 
in his own community, went around saying, do you guys remember what I used to be like? Do you remember how I used to live among the tombs? you remember how crazy I was? Well, Jesus came into my life. He restored my life. If only you could meet Jesus, then you would know salvation like I know salvation. And year after year after year after year, he continued to share that message until one day a new group of people filled with the Holy Spirit that came to them on the day of Pentecost came into their city and said, yes, we want to confirm what this man has said. Yes, Jesus has died for you, and he can restore you as well. That's why the early church was able to spring up so fast. Not just because one person got saved, but because that one person accepted the mantle of being a missionary, a minister, an ambassador of the good things of God. And how the script was changed. It changed from the devil sending a legion to confront and confound and confuse the plan of God. And Jesus just took that thing and said, nope. Victory is what I'm here about. I'm going to drive that legion out, and I'm going to raise up a new legion of people filled with the Holy Spirit. Has God done anything in your life? Has he changed your life at all? Now, this is dramatic. This is, man, out there. But God cares about even the small victories in your life. Have you struggled with selfishness, but through submission and prayer, you find yourself caring more about others than yourself? Have you struggled with an area of pride, an area of addiction? Have you struggled with any challenge in your life that God has brought you to the place of victory? If you're here today, if you're hearing my voice right now, it's because God has done something in your life. And whether it's, whether it's driving out a legion of demons or whether it's you listen to the still small voice of the Spirit and gave your heart and your mind and your soul to the Savior, you have the privilege of being an ambassador for Jesus. Because one day the Lord will return and He will look for those who have responded to His message been made whole and well through the power of His Spirit, and He'll want to redeem and restore all of His children once more. So what is He calling you to do? Lord Jesus, I know that we've heard many stories and uh, sermons, read many scriptures along these lines before. But God, as we study your Bible, as we look at each of these individual stories, and there are so many more uh, uh, applications and meanings that we can draw from this, but when we see the victory that you bring out of this individual, when you show your absolute power, if you can dispel the wickedness and the evil of that man's life, it should give us confidence that you can do that and more for us. I don't think any of us are, are, are of that challenge, but maybe we're dealing with that greater challenge of selfishness and pride that prevent us from even coming before you, Lord. But, oh, Father, before you come again, you are raising up people filled with your Spirit to be ambassadors and missionaries for you. So, Lord, each in our own way, whether it's a, a co-worker, someone in our house, someone in our neighborhood or our community, Lord, that you would use us to tell of the great things you have done for us, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for hanging with, uh, with us today as we go through that story. I, I hope there was some benefit to you in that. I hope that you have a wonderful Sabbath, and we look forward to having you again next week. Don't forget, we have potluck, and uh, we're going to have a great time. God bless you. Happy Sabbath.